Yeah, well, like they said, my name is Logan Lucas. Um, I'm a junior over at Round County Senior High School. A little bit about me is I play two sports. I play golf and tennis. Um, yes, they're two old people sports, but I can play them for the rest of my life. They're fun. I enjoy it. Have great connections through that. Okay, I got a question for y'all in here. Who in here is currently in a relationship? Raise your hand. Who in here? Okay, okay, yeah. There's a, there's a, there's a good amount in here. Um, for those of you who did not raise your hand, uh, I did not see a lot of y'all looking around, and that's probably why you're single, because you're not aware of the people around you. I'm just kidding, no. Uh, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just messing with you. Valentine's Day is not like a couple's day, I don't think. I think it's National Singles Awareness Day, so yes, exactly. Uh, but... So let's jump right into this. So what is the, like, biblical perspective of dating in the Bible? Well, there is actually none. There is no biblical perspective on dating in the Bible. And it talks about biblical, it like, costs like, uh, like having Christ relate, like relationships, but there's nothing on dating. And probably because we would already be married if we were back in Bible time. Well, I, I mean, 200 years ago, I mean, people's parents were still picking out who, who married them, but it's like, imagine nowadays your parents picking who you'd married. I know a lot of y'all in here would not want that to be your parents picking, like, who you'd be marrying, and uh, it's like, imagine a dating app, and your parents have the login, but it's for marriage, and, like, they get a pick for you. All right, well, let's get back on track here, and so in dating, there is only two outcomes, and that is either you will break up or you will marry them. And so I describe, like, a, like this is how I imagine, like, a typical dating couple. It's like they meet, and whether that is they're, like, have class with them, you know. I don't know. Some of y'all in here, you'd be sitting in class, and you got, like, like that hallway crush, you know what I mean? Like, you're walking around, you're like, I, I reroute the way I walk to class just so I can see them, like, two times, but I'm too scared to go walk up to them. But, like, you see them in the hall, or, like, you finally get enough courage, like, to go up there and, like, talk to them and like ask for their number, ask for the Snapchat, something like that. And they're like, then you all both like just fall in love. You're just like, this is the best thing ever. This is, this is amazing. And then you all start dating. And then the guy's like telling all of his friends, he's like, man, she's just, she's just so cool. She's just, she's just amazing. She's, I love her so much. And it's been and like, I mean, I got some friends, they just, they just talk the whole time and they're like, and I'm like, dude, just, just calm down. Like you've known her for like a week. Like, just calm down. And the girl's, like, telling, like, all of her friends, like, he's the best guy I've ever dated. I, I love him so much. And like I said, it's been, like, three weeks, and already, like, I love you so much. And that's just reckless, like, personally. Like, that's, that's a little bit too quick for me. Blinded by love, blinded by looks, blinded by lust. And then three months. The three-month rule. I know if you all heard of that before. And it's, like, some of the imperfections start showing up, and it's like you're not as funny anymore, not as cute or serious. And they, they're definitely not as smart as you thought they were either, and they just don't have any common sense. And now there's conflict, conflict, and then the red flags pop up. And some of those red flags that I see is like arguing about everything. Oh, my goodness, I've seen that. And it's like, what are you all, like, even, there's no even point to be arguing about that. Like, it's, like, just pointless. But they argue about everything, controlling, jealous. She doesn't like your friends. He doesn't like your, she, he doesn't like your friends. And then it's just, like, and they're, like, I can't live without you. And, like, they just, the whole world just revolves around that other person. And clingy, verbal abuse. Don't, don't, do not settle for that. But if you do ignore all of those red flags, and then months or, I don't know, a couple of years even pass, and then you're now like, what do I do? Break up? No. Can't break up. I have, I have time invested in this relationship. I mean, we've already slept together. Who else would want me? Who wants to start over? I mean, we told people we were going to get married. And then, I mean, you're like, well, I mean, well, you get, you're like, well, get married. And then you're just like, well, I, I guess, I guess he's the one. I guess she's the one. I mean, they, no, one else would, no one else would put up with me. They promised me they would change. Promises don't show commitment. Preparation does. And this is why you need to communicate beforehand. And you're probably wondering, well, why even talk about this? And it's because your decisions determine your destiny. And so, like, in, in the same way, think about what you decide about Christ determines your eternity. And so, if you're single or you're dating... Understand the importance of marrying the right person. And I know marriage is a long way away for us, for a lot of us. Like, 
I mean, it is, it is, but it's still out there. Like, you still got to think about that things, and I know we do think about that things. And so, um, this is just, I mean, for, this is my first point, and it is God doesn't choose your spouse for you. And so, the Bible does not teach us that God chooses your spouse. Uh, it's your decision, and it's your choice. I mean, God puts, the, God puts that responsibility on us. I mean, God will guide, he'll guide us. He'll lead us, he'll direct us, but it is overall our choice who we choose to marry. And a lot of times we chase after a relationship with people instead of chasing after a relationship with God. Maybe if we chased God as hard as we chase people, God will give us people we don't have to chase. And so, uh, and, I, and you and that person, uh, you need to be the same with God, and I'll explain that more in just a second. But has anybody in here ever chopped wood before? Like firewood, chopped firewood. Okay, yeah, a lot more than I expected. But well, wood, one thing when you're chopping wood, you want to make sure you have a sharp axe, right? I mean, who wants to go chop firewood with a dull axe? That's, that's just stupidity because it's going to be a lot harder to do. And so you start off with a sharp axe. So the more wood you cut, the duller the axe gets. That's the same with the relationship. Because if iron sharpens iron, what doesn't sharpen iron? Wood. Yes, I, wood does not sharpen iron. And so if iron and wood are in a constant relationship, the iron can never get sharper, and the person who's the wood will become damaged, and the one who's the axe will become duller. And so this is why the Bible tells us to be in relationship with someone who is also in a relationship with God, because that's the iron sharpens iron. And so, I mean, personally, which I know a lot of people, they, like, one of the greatest things, like, a relationship can be is to be Christ-centered. Because it takes two people to have a relationship, but it takes three people to keep it. So here, I just want to walk through some things about, like, if you're dating or you ever want to date, I just have three questions and I'd like, to, like for you to answer and help to see if that person you're dating has a chance. And so number one is, are they following Jesus? And that is not, do they know about Jesus? Not do they go to church on Christmas or Easter or they go to summer camp? Are they following Jesus or are they just dating the church? Are they going through the motions of that? Uh, I mean, because they can can still come to church and not know Jesus. And so how do you know? Well, here are some things that, here's some how you can tell by the things they do. And I mean, are they reading their Bible? Are they serving? Do they have that posture of humility? If they're not serving, they're not growing. And are are they in a group or do they have a group of Christian friends in your life? Personally, for me, that's a very big thing is you got to have that close-knit community of, like, Christian believers that you can talk to about and live life with because we are better together. If you isolate yourself, the enemy will assassinate you. When, you. when you go in that time just and don't have that strong community around you, it is, it is not healthy at all. If the person you're dating is not helping you get closer to Jesus, you're probably dating the wrong person. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 15 says, Don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can righteousness be partnered with wickedness? How can light, say light, say light. How can light live with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be partnered with an unbeliever? So if you're wanting God's best in your life, I, would pers- I wouldn't even consider someone who's not, cr- not committed to Christ. Stop trying to use dating as an evangelistic tool. You'll end up regretting it and because you cannot have that emotional, physical, or all the other connections with that person if you don't have a spiritual connection. But even if both of you are Christians, it's still not enough. Question number two is, are they heading in the same direction as you? I mean, you're like, well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, she's just, she's just really pretty. I just, I just like the, the way she just walks, and she's just, she's just, oh, my gosh, she's just so pretty. And take note, like, this has been, like, three weeks of them knowing each other, and you're just like, I mean, she's just, she's just amazing. And you're not thinking ahead. You're thinking about things now. You're blinded by love, lust, and looks. You're not thinking about the bigger overall picture here. 
Amos 3.3 3 says, can two people walk together without agreeing on the direction? And so I urge you all to please, like, agree on that, which, I mean, a lot of us here are young. But still, that is a thing we need to be thinking about. Agree on the direction before it gets too serious. Kids, I mean, that's a long way for, like, a lot of us. But kids, I mean, that's a thing you need to talk about. I mean, career, where, where, what do I, where does my life, where do I envision my life going, going to school, what am I going to major in, things like that. Guy wants to stay in, in his hometown. Girl wants to move to the big city, like, things like that. Do they have the same vision for their life as you? Because two visions bring division, and you will be divided. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are God's masterpiece. He's created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. The Bible teaches us that you're not on earth here by accident. And he has that mission for our lives that he has, he has, that, he has that mission for your life that only you can fulfill. He has a purpose for you. He has a calling for you. He has a vocation unique just for you. He has a ministry for you. Because as Christians, all of us are called to be in ministry, whether that's full-time ministry or just spreading the word of God. So if you are a Christian, that's that w- as believers, we need to be going after people because we're not promised tomorrow. And so God has a plan for every single one of us in here. But sometimes God's plan isn't the way we want our plan to go. And I know that there's some things in my life that I want to go a certain way, and then it doesn't. And I'm like, God, this is how I envisioned it going. And he's like, no, just just wait. Just wait. And some of you, you've been hurt. You've been hurt before. God has removed that guy from your life. God has removed that girl from your life. But God tells us that he isn't going to take something out of our life without replacing it with something better. Some of you are so focused right now on your future plan that, that you're not focusing on what God has for us, and we don't realize that we're right in the middle of the things that we used to pray for because we're just too focused on the things around us. And some of us are in the middle of waiting. Well, in the middle of, middle of waiting, like, you need to be praying. If you don't have anybody that you're even talking to or just having, just be praying, praying for that guy, praying for that girl during your season of waiting. And I know it can be tough during a season of waiting. I mean, I can relate hard to that, and... <laughs> But, um, I mean, the Lord, he smiles. Like, when you're just praying for that person or you know, like, just God just smiles down on that because he knows that you'll be praying with that guy or the girl that he has for you when you're not in that season of waiting anymore. And that's over. So that's why we need to trust in God's plan. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. God has a promise for all of us in here, and, and we're over here like we're on the starting line like, well, God, what's, what's the promise? I mean, I'll, I'll go when you tell me the promise that you have for me. I'll obey when you tell me the promise. God isn't just going to lay our whole life out before us and just like, here's what you're going to do. Here's where you're going to code college. Here's who you're going to marry. He isn't gonna, he's not just going to lay it all out right before us. We just have to go. We have to trust in his plan. So who in here has seen The Wizard of Oz before? Probably mostly everybody ever heard of it. And so that's the Christian life. It's like the yellow brick road. It's, I mean, you don't see where it leads until you step. And then you take another step. And there's another brick, and you keep on going. And faster we go, the steps keep on coming quicker. Psalms 32, 8 says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. But instead, we're over here on the starting line, and we're waiting for God to show us everything and our whole plan for our lives, and we're not taking the walk down the path God has for us because we don't step until we know what's going to happen. But God says, my plans aren't your plans. My thoughts aren't your thoughts. And if he he says, if if I showed you where you were going, you try to figure out another alternative plan to get there. But God says, my plans are just right for you to show you your life purpose. 
And the tragedy is most people never discover their life purpose. Mark Twain says, the two most important days in your life is the day you are born and the day you find out why. Question number three, is this someone you can see spending the rest of your life with? And that's, I mean, that's a big thing. I mean, spend the rest of your life with somebody. So how do you know? Well, like I said, like, God isn't just going to, like, drop them right in front of us and be like, yep, that, that's the person right there. There's not going to be, like, just a light, like a beam of light just shine down on them and be like, yep, that, that's, that's, who I want you to, that's who I want you to spend the rest of your life with right there. And without dating them, I mean, you'll, you'll never know if they are truly the one. And so, but the things that we talked about, I think, are the best, that some of the things we just talked about are the best way to start going towards that and praying through that and trusting God's plan. An article from 2022 shows that only 2% of high school sweethearts lead to marriage. Only 2%, which is, I mean, there's a lot of people in the United States, but so that's a very, that's a very small percent. If you're shooting 2% from the three, you just need to stop. Like, that's bad. Um, well, my brother, he's in that top 2%. He, well, he was in eighth grade and she was a freshman, but They've been together for over six years now. They got engaged last August. I love them both to death. But they have that Christ-centered relationship. They're both followers of Christ. And they both know the path that God has showed them where they're wanting to go, in their, where he wants them to go in their lives. And God has, that's a, I mean, that, I think it's a bad, like, for me personally, like, where I'm over here and I've, like, been single for a long time. Well, forever, basically. Yeah, forever. Um, but... And I'm over here like this, and then my brother finds the love of his life, and he's in eighth grade. I don't think it's a really good example for me, but it does show me what it means to truly love somebody and have a Christ-centered relationship. So that's a great example for me. But another big thing is you really have to have peace about it. And time shows, like, the things of love. So over time, you got to do that. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 says, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. And I, so that, really, that verse is one of my favorite verses where it sticks out. It says, love is patient. Because, I mean, I, I strongly believe that. Like I said, I've been single for 17 years. So you, don't, you do not need to be discouraged when everybody around you is dating somebody. And you're like, and two, some of your friends are over here like, hey, let's, let's go out to eat. And it's like one, two of your friends and their girlfriends. And then you're sitting there and you're like the wheel on the back of a Jeep. You know what I mean? You're just like... Man, what am I doing here? I really need, to, really need to bring somebody with me. I really need to get a girlfriend. But you don't need to be dating somebody to be happy. Personally, I find my happiness in the Lord. I don't need to somebody else to fill that in my life. And I feel like I lean on God more than anything during that time of waiting. Because God's timing, not mine. God's will, not mine. God's plan, not mine because in the end, it's all for God's glory. And marriage, like I said, is a long way for a lot of us. But marriage is permanent. And, I mean, you gotta, you got to be thinking, do I have that chemistry with that person? Can I get along with them? Like, are you attracted to them? Of course, you got to be attracted to them. Like, you can't not, not be attracted to them and then just like, well, I mean, I guess I'll just get married to them. But that's a big, that's a big thing, too. Personalities. I mean, does your personalities, do they clash? Hobbies, ambitions, goals, those are all big things that need to be considered in that. Another thing is, if they never change, would you still want to be with them? So going back to like what we talked about with those red flags and stuff, it's like the verbal abuse, the arguing, greediness, jealousy, hateful, ungrateful. If they never change, would you still want to be with them? So you're probably asking, well, what are my next steps? And top of the top, very top is you need to be begin a relationship with Jesus Christ tonight. And that's the biggest starting point. Get your you need to get God in your life. Until you've experienced the unconditional love of God, you can't love them the way they deserve to be loved. Get involved in church. I know a lot of people in the youth ministry come here, serve on Sunday. I serve every single Sunday. Get involved in the church. 
Discover God's vision for your life. Like I said back in Jeremiah, Jeremiah, it says, I have a plan for you, not to hurt you. I will give you hope and a good future. Sit down and begin to work on and praying to God how he wants you to live out your life. God, pray through those things. Like, I know a lot of seniors here, like, just decide on where you're going to college. That's a very big step in your life. But praying through that with God and getting God, God involved in that, like, God, where do you want me to go? That is one of, that's the best thing to you, that you can do. What does God want me to do with my life? Another, another next step would be just go slow. If you're dating somebody, you need to find out all you can about the person you're dating. Because like I said before, love is patient. So take it slow. You do not need to be moving crazy fast and be dating them within three weeks of knowing them. You need to, you need to slowly pursue them with the way that God has envisioned for you all. And dating couples, I know all y'all are in, a bunch of y'all in here raising your hand, so I know a lot of y'all are taken. So this is... I know the stuff we talked about, I mean, it can be tough. I mean, some of y'all might just realize that the person you're with right now isn't the one. And I beg you to end that as soon as you can. And then some of you, you realize you're right on track. You're right on track how God wants you. You're right in God's plan. You're following that yellow brick road. You're doing everything that God's envisioned for you. And you're walking that out. And I encourage you to keep doing, doing that exact same thing. Are you becoming the person that you are looking for is looking for? How do I know what God wants me to do? Proverbs 3, 6 says, seek his will in all you do. And he will show you which path to take. God want, does, he does not want to, he wants the best plan for our lives. And the best thing we can do is just put our trust in him and just follow his plan. Because he, like he has plans for us to prosper, like I said. He wants the best for us. If y'all will go ahead and bow your heads and close your eyes. Some of you in here tonight, you can really relate to this. And some of you know that the way your relationship is going in your life right now is not the way God wants it to be going. So I just pray that the Lord, he'll give you strength, he'll give you the courage to do what is right, to, to, to change either in that relationship or change it for the better. And you can only do that by, you can only change it for the better if you're both following Jesus. We need to be focusing more on God and trusting his plan that he has for us because that's the best thing we can do is trust in his plan. To the other people in the room, you know God is calling you towards him. You can feel that. I know you can. And you know that your next step is to give your life to him. So if you're ready to repent of your sins and confess that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, I just want to ask you to say this prayer with me. And a prayer won't save you, but your lips can proclaim what your heart declares. And if your heart declares that Jesus Christ is Lord, then you'll be saved. Because he came for us, he died for us, and he rose up out of the grave for you and me. We do not deserve the gift that he has given us. So if you can just repeat this after me. God, I'm sorry. God, I've messed up. God, I've sinned. But I believe you came for me. I believe you died for me. I believe you got up out of the grave for me. And today, the best I know how, I repent of my sins and put my faith in you. Jesus, I've turned from my past ways. I've turned from my old ways. And I've turned to you. I declare you as Lord of my life. So just please forgive me. And if that's you, with all heads bowed and all eyes closed, no one looking around, if that was you tonight, and you declare him as your Lord and Savior of your life, on the count three, I'm going to ask you if you would just slip up your hand. And I'm not here like to embarrass you at all or anything like that. I just want to know. I want to be praying for you. One, I'm so proud of you. Two, Jesus loves you. And three, if that was you, would you just slip up your hand tonight? I see that hand. 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 
I'm so proud of all of you all. I'm so proud of all of you all that just took that next step, and I'm so proud of all you all in here too, and I'll be praying for every single one of you. I want you to know that Jesus has a better life for you. He's a better plan for, the, for you than you can ever imagine. If that was you and you just gave your life to the Lord tonight, tell somebody. Tell me. Tell Josh. Tell Brandon. Any of the team members here, we would love, love just to talk to you. We would be praying for you. We want to help you on, your, on this journey. God, we come to you here tonight, and we just thank you. We just thank you for allowing us to do this. We just thank you for the way that we're seeing this, this grow and this wonderful, this wonderful youth ministry, God. We're doing th- you're doing things that we could never imagine. And it all starts with you. So, God, I just, I just thank you, and I thank you for everybody who gave their life to the Lord tonight. And I pray that you will just help them to show them that the path that you have for them is the best. Just thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross. Because without you, we can't do anything. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.